Okay, let's get ready to go here with our induction ceremony. Our first inductee tonight is Bruce Schmidt. The 1992 Bronco football team won the Section 70 title by defeating Proctor. Stuart, what was the score? Stuart, what was the score of that Proctor game? 1992. 21 to nothing, right? Greg Field at UMB, right? I got that right, 21 nothing? 21 It was the night before, if I did my math correctly, it was the night before the girls won their state championship title. It was held in, in uh, Northfield. It was a great time to be a Bronco. I found this quote in the paper. After the game, Bruce was quoted as saying, at the beginning of the year, I thought we would be in rebuilding mode, but I'm not surprised anymore by these kids. This is a Cinderella team, and those types of teams tend to go a long way. I'd like to see this team be in the dome in a couple of weeks. Here's what is written on Bruce's flag. Bruce Schmidt was born December 15, 1947 in Hutchinson, Minnesota. Bruce was a three-sport athlete at Stewart School, High School. In football, Schmidt was a running back and captained his season, season, senior season. He named all-conference honorable mention. Bruce was a wrestler, qualified for the Minnesota State Tournament his senior year. He was also a member of the track and field team. Schmidt would attend Bemidji State University on a football scholarship following high school. Bruce graduated from BSU in 1976 with his degrees in physical education and health and business education. Schmidt took a teaching job in International Falls in 1976 and coached football and track and field. He coached B team football for two seasons starting in 1977 and then coached with the varsity team from 1979 to 1998. During that time, the football team won seven conference championships and five section championships and coached three All-State players. In 1993, Schmidt was named Minnesota Outstanding Assistant Football Coach of the Year. Bruce was a member of the Bronco Track and Field Coaching staff from 1977 to 1999, and he was named Minnesota Track and Field Assistant Coach of the Year in 1999. Schmidt coached three state championships and champions, excuse me, in track and field among the 22 different athletes coached at the state meet had six school records set by his throwers and had an athlete compete at the state meet in 20 of his 23 seasons of coaching. Starting in 2005, the Bronco Track and Field team began awarding the Bruce Schmidt Award to an individual each season for outstanding contributions to the Bronco Track and Field team. Schmidt was named the Teacher of the Year for ISD 361 in 1995, and at the time of his induction, Bruce was retired living in International Falls and Arizona with his wife, Shirley. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2024 Bronco Athletic Hall of Fame inductee, Bruce Schmidt. Thanks, Tim. I feel honored to be inducted into the Bronco Athletic Hall of Fame. Thanks to the committee for selecting me. Thanks to my beautiful wife, Shirley, for always supporting me in my coaching career, and our awesome three kids, Tamara, Lori, and Ryan for giving me the opportunity to coach them in some of the sports that they were involved in. It was truly an honor. Congratulations go out to Howard Millen, Craig Dahl, and Dave Luria. Congratulations to the 1992 4x800 girls relay team and coach Kelly for placing second in the state track and field meet and breaking the school record. Congratulations to the 1992 Cross Country State Champions and Ray Wood. I received this honor because of the dedicated and terrific athletes I coach as an assistant football line coach in both offense and defense, and as an assistant track and field coach for both the boys and girls in the shot put and distance throw. As an assistant football coach, I had three all state football players Pat O'Brien, 1989. Chad Larson, 1992. Chad Johnson, 1995. Also had two football players qualify for the All-Star football game. Chris Clark, 1989. Pat O'Brien, 1989. As an assistant track and field coach, I had three state champions. Kathleen Johnson, discus throw of 129 feet 
Nine inches. Bill Rindall, 1992. Discus throw, 162 feet. Seth Worm, 1999. Southwood, 59 feet. I had three runner-ups, second place in the state track and field meet. Brenda Pierce, 1980 Southwood, 42 feet, nine inches. She missed being a state champion by two inches. Misty Barr, 1994, Southwood throw, 42 feet, five inches. Misty was in the state meet, it was really drizzling, and Kathleen Johnson had passed on the secret, put on a pair of wool socks over the shoes when you're throwing. <laughs> Misty Barr, when I told her about this at the meet, she said, that's not gonna be very classy. She tried it, and she ended up in second place. Then Pal Bryan, 1990, discus throw, 173 feet, three inches. Three and a half inches. And with Pal Bryan, he took, uh, took over Charlie Cook's history record, said in 1972. But he came home and Stuart Norco said, you don't measure discus in a half, half an inch. I said, the state track me they did, but he was concerned because Pal Bryan, three and a half inches was longer than Charlie's throw of uh, 173, two inches. Third place, Todd Pavlik, 1979, South Wood Throw, 57 feet, five inches. Fourth place at the state track and field meet, Les Glover, 1988, South Wood Throw, 57 feet, 10 inches. Fourth place, Cheryl Anderson, 1988, Discus Throw, 157 feet, seven inches. Fifth place, Carlos Johnson, South Wood Throw, 41 feet, five inches. Sixth place in the state track and field meet, Burt Roberts, 1982, discus throw, 164 feet, two inches. It takes a lot to get to the state meet, if it's football, hockey, basketball, or track and field, where you have individuals that can't qualify. To qualify, you have to be first or second place. The following Bronco participants were either first or second in the region meet. Sheldon Bowe, Jim Hamilton, Chad Johnson, Ben Brown, Shanoa Christensen, Gene Rowe, Wayne Roberts, Peggy McCoda, Chad Larson, and Chad Major. Six school records were broken. 1979, Arlos Johnson, 43 feet 7 inches in the 8 pound south foot. 1979, Todd Pavlik, 57 feet 5 inches in south foot. 1980, Brenda Pierce, 42 feet 9 inches in the 4K shot foot. 1988, Kathleen Johnson, 129 feet 9 inches in the discus throw. 1990, Al Bryan, 173 feet 3 and a half inches in the discus throw. And Seth Worm, 59 feet in the shot foot. Seven All Americans, that's post secondary. 1982, Todd Pavlik, Brenda Pierce, Junior College All-American. 1986, Carlos Johnson, International Olympic lifter. 1989, Pat O'Brien, High School All-American. 1991, 92, 93, Kathleen Johnson, NCAA College All-American. 1995, Will Grindall, NCAA College All-American. Then 1997-98, Misty Barr, NCAA College All-American. Because of these outstanding athletes, I stand here tonight. It's been one hell of a fun, good ride. Thank you, Bruce. Our next inductee is Craig Dahl. How about this to cap off your high school hockey career? This is from the Daily Journal story on the 1972 state championship hockey game. Keeping the pressure on, the Broncos got what proved to be the game-winning goal when Craig Dahl came from behind the Grand Rapids net and moved into the slot. His wrist shot hit the far corner and all but wrapped up the game as the time was running out on the Indians. I do have a question for you, Craig. I hope you'll answer in front of everybody here. Did Coach Rossett Players talk to the newspaper because I searched and searched for a quote from any player in the 1972 season, and there was not one. 
So maybe I'll answer that question for you. Here's what's written on Craig's plaque. Craig Bell was born May 19, 1954 in International Falls. Craig was a six-time letter winner as a Bronco before graduating in 1972, twice each in football, hockey, and baseball. He played mostly quarterback as a junior, and then during his senior season, Dahl was co-captain of the football team with Jim Knapp and was named all Iron Ridge Conference and to the WCCO All State team. Dahl was a member of the 1970-71 hockey team that won the Iron Range Conference and Region 7 Championships and placed third at the Minnesota State Hockey Tournament. Craig was co-captain, again with Knapp, on the 1971-72 hockey team that won the Region 7 Championship, the Minnesota State Championship, and that team was inducted into the Bronco Athletic Hall of Fame just last year. Dahl was named to the All-State Tournament team, Dahl also was Iron Range Con all Iron Range Conference in 1972 with 38 goals and 31 assists. After high school, Craig attended Princeton University where he was a member of the freshman men's hockey team in 1972-73, scoring 16 goals and 24 assists before joining the Tiger varsity team from 1973 to 1976. Dahl recorded 34 goals and 27 assists in his three seasons. He graduated from Princeton in 1977 with a degree in political economics. Craig coached the 1976-77 women's club hockey team at Princeton to a winning record, and they were runner-ups in the Ivy League playoffs. Craig worked for affiliate companies in Norwest Corporation for 22 years. Dahl then worked for TCF for 22 years, becoming the chief executive officer and chairman of the board before retiring in 2020. At the time of his induction, Craig lived in Invergrove Heights with his wife, Robin. Ladies and gentlemen, 2024 Bronco Athletic Hall of Fame inductee, Craig Dahl. Well, the uh, older I get, the better I was. <laughs> so that, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, I wanna say thank you to the committee and especially also Rick McBride for nominating me originally. My parents would have loved to be here tonight. My sisters who provided great support during my high school years and beyond. My brother-in-laws, can we just keep it up? My kids who never got tired of hearing the history to my stories which were all true, by the way. And, and my wife, who never gets tired of hearing that the only difference between South St. Paul, her hometown, and International Falls is six state high school hockey championships. <laughs> so I got a, um, we're a family full of uh, one-liners and everything, but I've got to start out here with a, with a true story. Just happened yesterday. My daughter and son were all during our t time coming up, driving up from the cities to, to, the, to Rainy, were always discussing my driving skills. Now Aaron said that I needed to slow down once we reached the, the uh, city limits on the east side of town, whereas Casey said not to worry because he would play the card, do you know who I am? And, <laughs> I would tell them, hey, I'm big city Craig Dahl, and they would just let me drive away. I said, okay. Well, yesterday, that actually happened. <laughs> I, this is a true story. I got witnesses. I was stopped in Orr for going nearly 40 in a 30. <laughs> and I'm like, how, how, and there's a car in front of me. I don't, I don't even know how I, I, got a, I got pulled over. But he, he let me off with a warning, and uh, so I don't, I don't think that um, at the end of the day when they all got together, the talk about he, he, he was the highlight was, well, I pulled the guy over in Oregon, almost 40, and I let him off with a warning. So I really, really appreciate that uh, support. Well, there have been a lot of great athletes here, and I'm truly humbled by this honor. I was lucky that the era I grew up in, you could play and really were expected to play multiple sports. So I just rotated from football to hockey to baseball, started over again. 
and I want to congratulate the other honorees who have very impressive resumes. Um, you know, the, the thing about being able to play multiple sports is we never suffered from the burnout that you hear so many kids who are forced into one, uh, one sport. And the, the opportunity to play for your high school was still an honor at that point. Um, the opportunities that I received were the foundation of my path in life. Because of the hockey success, I was able to go to Princeton University, which was a cornerstone of my formal education, which led me to the banking industry, and it's, it's been covered. I spent 22, this, like my dad, worked 40 years at the mill. I worked 44 years, 22 of them at Norwest Corporation and 22 at TCF, where I finished as chairman of the board and CEO. Now, certainly I didn't get everything that <clears throat> at the falls, but it set me up to try to achieve bigger things. First of all, I'm so old that when I, when I went to Princeton, there were still freshman teams, so we weren't eligible to play on the varsity. We had to play other, uh, other uh, schools or uh, prep schools. Um, I was <clears throat> only able to play on there. I guess I covered that. So I played three years of varsity hockey, graduated with a degree in political economics, and entered the banking business. Because of my Minnesota roots, I worked on many big Minnesota accounts, including Arctic Cat, Bland and Paper Company, Marvin Windows, to name a few. But what really set me up was the willingness to compete for business. Being a smaller bank gave land opportunities that big banks didn't have or didn't care about, which was a lot like the Falls. We all wanted to play for the Broncos, and getting the opportunity to play quarterback was a great opportunity. The, only, the early games meant great Minnesota weather, but as the calendar changed, so did the weather. We always had at least two games in blizzards, but we always seemed to win those games. There wasn't a playoff system for football then, so we lost the chance to compete, and I always felt we would have been very competitive even though our records were only four and five and five and four. It was a different case in hockey where our overall record was 46, seven and one, and we won the third place game in 1971 and the state championship in 1972. There's one story I'd like you to tell me about, <clears throat> tell you about my hockey career was that I was on a rotating shift for the, uh, for the Broncos. I was alternating in the third line every other shift. So if there was a, so I, I was always going to sit out every other shift. And if there was a penalty or power play, my line got skipped over. So it could be a long time between shifts. But Jeff Lindvall got cut by a skate in his mouth. This is a scary story. He got 44 stitches in his mouth. And um, so Ross had a decision to make. Was he gonna elevate the other guy on the third line up to the first line, or was he gonna put me on the first line? Well, he picked the other guy. So I played with my regular line uh, for the next game, and uh, I scored a hat trick in a six to four win. So that kept me on a regular line, and I scored three goals in the next two games, and that pretty much eliminated the alternating. But that just go goes to show you how what, what, how thin that line is from getting a chance and not getting a chance. Now my next quick story here has to be about Edina. I always, they were the cake eaters of hockey. I always <laughs> felt, I always felt that it was, uh, it was my way of life against their way of life. And those were the biggest games we played. Well, I only played against Edina three times. Once we were down th uh, three to nothing in midget state championship and beat them four to three in overtime. And then we beat them in the falls my junior year. And then we tied them uh, in the falls my senior year. So I always felt pretty good about that. Um, they were still gonna be the team to beat when they came to state, they only had one tie, but they got upset by Grand Rapids. And I used to kid these guys that I worked with that played at Edina. I was, oh yeah, that was the year you were playing in the morning. Yeah, so. 
So I learned so much here and got so many opportunities to, to lead and that carried over so much into my career because I took that team approach to the, to the people that I worked with. Um, it, it's, it was a great place to grow up. I really appreciate this honor and uh, congratulations to everyone else. Thank you. For our next inductee, I will have Kevin DeGrissi come up and do the introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Craig, 38 goals, 31 assists, 69 points. That's pretty impressive in any era. You were a great goal scorer and a great guy. Most of the success of Dave Lorian has received in the sports career came from being a hockey goalie and a hockey coach. Dave also was a class AA pole vault champion in 1977. And here's a snippet of the story in the Daily Journal. Lorian could do no better than ninth place last year when he injured his shoulder jumping earlier in the season. It seemed unlikely that he would make another state appearance. As luck would have it, Greenness, in the, greenness and the traditional turbulent winds of St. Cloud took its toll on six rookie contestants who failed to make the opening height of 12-6. Lorian and two others cleared the next increment of 13 feet, but at 13-4, Lorian was the only one to clear the bar, sending the junior jumper into first place with a gold medal performance. <laughs> The 60s and 70s were the glory days of Bronco hockey. The 60 days teams were legendary, but I think some of the 70 teams may have been as good. The difference, I think, was the rest of the state started to catch up. We had difficulty getting out of our section. With classes of over 300 students, there were lots of great players who, if they didn't make the Broncos by the time they were juniors, often quit. Playing behind Kevin Constantine, Dave didn't get a chance to play until he was a senior. He hung in there until he got his chance, and he made the most of it, and ended up getting a scholarship to go to Notre Dame. I was a senior at Notre Dame when Dave got there. He was brought in to be our number one goalie because our two guys had graduated the year before. Dave had a pretty rough training camp and we were lighting him up pretty good. <laughs> After a couple of weeks, our coach Lefty Smith was getting nervous and said, Nagurski, what's going on with this kid? We need a goaltender. And I said, well, I'll make a phone call. So I called Larry Ross and he said, when the puck drops, he'll be all right. We opened up a couple weeks later in Duluth and he stood on his head and ended up having a great freshman year. We weren't the best hockey team, but we were number one for a brief period before Christmas. Things fell off after that, but we had a very young team. But Dave, Dave, Dave held us in there a lot of games. The rest is history, all because Dave made the most of his senior year and didn't hang it up. There are a lot of great athletes, which Dave was one, but he is also a really good guy which is represented by the fact that eight of his Notre Dame teammates are here to support him tonight. These guys came from the east coast of Canada and the east coast of the U.S. and a couple from the Twin Cities, so it's a big deal, for, big deal to have them here for us. All right, here's what's written on Dave's plaque. Dave Florian was born April 26, 1960 in International Falls. He was an eight-time letter winner, twice in football, twice in hockey, and four times in track and field. Florian was a member of the Bronco football team that was co-champion of the final Iron Range Conference football season in 1977. As a running back, he averaged 12 yards per carry, which is still a Bronco team record for a season. Lorian was the top goaltender for the Falls High hockey team his senior year and was named All-Iron Range Conference. 
They've excelled in track and field, including winning the state championship in pole vault as a junior and held a school record of 14 feet for nearly 20 years. Lorian won the IRC pole vault title in 78 and was a member of the title winning 4x100 relay team. The Broncos won the IRC title all four seasons he was a member of the track and field team as well as Region 7 AA title in 1978. They've attended Notre Dame on a full athletic scholarship as a member of the Fighting Irish Hockey Team. He was a four-year letter winner and was named second team All-Central Collegiate Hockey Association his senior season in 1982. Lorian was named to Notre Dame's All-Decade Team for the 1980s. He was MVP of the gold medal winning team at the 1981 National Sports Festival and also played in the 1982 National Sports Festival, which was used to identify potential 1984 Olympic team prospects. Played in the night for the 1983 U.S. National Team, but was released when the final roster was named for the World Championships. He competed in training camps for the Calgary Flames in 1982 and the New York Rangers in 1983. In 1984, he moved to Alaska, started his college hockey coaching career, with the University of Alaska Fairbanks in 1985. He was elevated to head coach in 1994 and a master record of 80, 122, and 9, while transitioning the Nanooks to, to a Division I independent, from a Division I independent, into the powerful CCHA. He retired from coaching in 1999 and began his career as a sales representative with Pfizer, and earned the company's annual Premier Achievement Award seven times and was named to the Pfizer Hall of Fame. Dave still lives in Alaska, is retired, and coaches hockey from time to time. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Lorian. Well, usually when I get up to speak, I wing it, but I'm gonna try and uh, have a little bit of composure. But what these guys did last night, what's probably the most heartwarming thing that I've ever experienced. I had no clue that any of them were showing up. And Kevin Nagurski invited me out to dinner. He goes, let's just meet for a beer and something to eat, so let's meet at the border bar. So I got there, the two of us were talking, and all of a sudden, one of our teammates walks in, and I go, Berkey, what are you doing here? He goes, I'm just kind of passing through. And I go, it's International Falls in April. <laughs> passing through to where? And then right after that, a guy puts his hands over my eyes and goes, guess who? And I have no clue. And then one by one, seven of them come in. And my first thought was, you guys are crazy. <laughs> to travel as far as they did for a weekend, no fishing involved, um, to, to be here uh, for this honor for me, um, it was truly heartwarming. And that's the reason you play sport, is to meet people like that, um, they're your friends and as good as family for life. And I just want to say thank you, you guys, because I think you're a little crazy. But I even knew that before you got here. So, uh, but anyway, these are my college teammates. Whenever you play team sports, you know you're only as good as your teammates. And I do see a lot of my former teammates in high school here as well. Um, we had a lot of fun, and luckily, my class of 1978 was a very good class. We had a lot of very good athletes, and we would not have been able to do it without tremendous coaches that gave up of their time. I mean, John Prinnyman would have been here tonight. He goes, you know, I just finished coaching hockey for 35 years, and I look at what all of these coaches have done. It's a tremendous honor and a tremendous commitment what they did. Most of them back in the day, I don't think, got paid a dime. Um, they did it because they loved the sport, they loved us kids. And I grew up in a great era. Um, you know, I came from a large family, seven kids. Um, my youngest brother, Tom, is here. And, uh, I mean, we didn't have babysitters very much. We just ran outside for the whole day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, us five brothers all got along really well. And, a lot of pickup games and um, hockey out on the 
where the cars would drive by and they crush our ice chunks that were our goals. But um, I just, I look back on that era and our, we had tremendous teachers. I know the whole teaching profession has changed a little bit lately, a little bit tougher. Um, cell phones don't help. But um, and my mom was a teacher and she certainly kept, kept me in line. And uh, I just look back at, at what was able to happen for me and my family and, and the sports teams I was involved with uh, made it a real special time. I did write something that I wanted to share with you when they asked me to give them information for my nomination. And I'm going to need my reading glasses. When you get to be 63, what I said was this. I said, I look back on the years, my years at FHS with great memories of teammates, classmates, teachers, and coaches. It was a tremendous time in the history of our community. We were blessed with large classes, with lots of athletes, competitive sports teams at all levels, supportive parents, unselfish and gifted coaches, and very few financial herders that kept players off the field to play. It was a great time for kids to look up to the Bronco athletes, train to compete as Bronco athletes, and then look back on the many accomplishments they achieved as Bronco athletes. I, was all, I will always cherish my days of wearing the purple and gold. My class of 1978 had a number of great athletes. Howard Nevin and Neil Sheehy, who have both been inducted, Gary Sampson as well, and we had many others. I am proud to be a part of that class. And when Kevin mentioned the fact that I didn't look very good in tryouts at Notre Dame, I actually have, uh, I never saw this until I was completely done with my career. Larry Ross wrote to Lefty Smith and said, don't worry that Dave's no good in practice. <laughs> Basically give him an opportunity in the game and that's when he'll shine. So I guess I owe a little bit of thanks to Kevin to help him get, getting me, uh, I thought I was actually pretty good in practice. But <laughs> I, guess, I guess no one else did. Um, but what was interesting was I found another letter from Larry Ross, and that's the part of coaching that a lot of parents don't understand. It's not just what happens on the ice. This was a letter basically complaining to the Olympic Sports Committee. Um, my freshman year in college, he was questioning why George Amadon, Gary Sampson, or I were not being considered for a, a, a team that traveled to Switzerland or Sweden. And he just said, I know nothing can be changed now, but these three, in my opinion, are better than a number of the players that you did select. So just get it to the people that you think should see this. So, I mean, those are the things that you don't see what a coach does. Uh, it's behind the scenes, but uh, it just makes a big difference in, uh, you know, sometimes the opportunities that athletes can get. Um, I definitely want to thank my family table as well. Uh, I have three daughters, all played at athletics, very good at it, and uh, two of the three are here. My middle daughter, Sarah, lives at Anchorage, but the two from Minneapolis are here. Uh, Mackenzie, my oldest, and Sydney, my youngest. Uh, my brother, Tom, and his wife, Tanya. My, my mother was here, but she's 94, and she got a little tired, so she went home. But I want to give a shout out to her. Um, Kind of an interesting thing. My dad, I can never remember him questioning anything about my sports career. He didn't talk about referees, coaches, teammates, when I didn't play, when I did play. He was not very involved. He came to the games and cheered, but he wasn't a, you know, a, a boisterous parent. My mom a little bit more, but she encouraged me to play hockey and helped me learn how to skate. I think she looked at me after looking at my older brothers and said, this guy's not gonna be a six foot basketball player. <laughs> um, so she redirected me towards hockey and uh, that was a good thing. Um, I wasn't a three foot leaper either, so. But one, one thing I remember with my mom, she would always say when I got in the car after practice or a game, so did you have fun? And if I ever said I didn't, she'd say, well, I think you need to think about that because if you're not having fun, then you shouldn't play. And I remember one time we played against a team from Roseau. If you know the Neil Broughton 
Aaron Broughton and Butsy Erickson. All three were about my size. They all played in the NHL. Well, they were a line for Rosa when we were peewees. And I remember I got in the car one time and we got beaten 11 to one. And my mom goes, did you have fun? I go, mom, we got beat 11 to one. No, I didn't have fun. And she goes, well, I thought you outperformed the other goalie. <laughs> I went, yeah, I probably had 50 saves and he had 10. <laughs> but it actually became a motto and one thing that I would ever talk to goaltenders uh, throughout the coaching camps, I said, you got two goals in a game. Win the game, outperform the other goalie. <laughs> if you don't win the game, you can still say you won something if you had a lot of saves because you're here to develop and you don't develop much if you only get 10 saves. So you want to be the goalie that gets 50 saves. So it's just kind of what I tried to remind the players when I was, was helping them. Um, I also look back at being on a team sport and being on an individual sport like pole vaulting. And I think it's a valuable lesson. Um, obviously a team, you're, the team wins and the team loses. But when you're a pole vaulter or a sprinter, it's you and everybody else. There's no one else to blame if you don't do well, and you can pat yourself on the back when you do do well. And my experience pole vaulting, uh, Ray Wood was my uh, pole vaulting coach. Um, I won the state championship my junior year, which was a great opportunity, you know, the thrill of victory. The next year I didn't make it to the state, and that was the agony of defeat, uh, but it's humbling, and I think the lessons in life are certainly learned by all those different types of experiences. And uh, I do want to introduce the coaches that were able to attend and be at my table. I have a list I made of all the coaches that I've had throughout my career, and it's about 40 long. And some unfortunately have passed and are not with us anymore, but I'm glad to see that some are here and uh, really great to be able to uh, relive some of the memories that we had. And uh, if, if the coach is there, Terry Thompson, Terry Burns, Coach Dick Ostrut, Rich Johnson, who uh, was my fifth grade Pepsi-Cola coach. <laughs> and Alan Rasmussen walked up to me and said, you remember I was your third grade coach? <laughs> and I, 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 didn't even, I didn't even know I played hockey in fifth, <laughs> third grade. But, um, so, uh, and Alan Rasmussen's here as well. Um, but I just wanted to have a shout out to those folks. Buzzy Christensen too, came in a little late, but I was glad he's here. Uh, you know, John Prettyman, uh, there's just a lot of people that have dedicated a lot of their life uh, to help make our lives as kids better. And it's very much appreciated. Um, my wife is not here. Um, My wife is not here, but she had obviously nothing to do with my athletic career before Notre Dame, or Notre Dame and before, but she was in the stands with our three girls, uh, trying to keep them in control for a lot of the Nanook hockey games. And uh, so she was a big part of just being a good parent and a, a good wife uh, during that time frame. Um, and I just really enjoyed the fact that I uh, was able to be a parent of kids that played sports. I was the father that never complained about the refs. I never pounded on the glass. I tried not to be a coach when they came off the field. I just offered suggestions. Um, but I really appreciate uh, being honored tonight. Um, it's the most fun speech I've ever given. And uh, I just appreciate everything that this town and, and the, the teachers and the, the coaches provided to me and I will never forget it, and I appreciate the great crowd here tonight. Um, so I just wanna say thank you and congratulations to the rest of the nominees. And it's nice to be in the Hall, Hall of Fame now that Neil's in it, because we've always been competitive, and he's never said to me, you know, ha ha, you never got in, and I did. I wanna, I wanna think, though, that I was a better athlete than Neil in high school, and he's a younger. He definitely outperformed me at the pro level. So I want to challenge him when we're 65 to a little decathlon to see who wins. You know, push-ups, sit-ups, maybe a 30-yard dash, and I'll see if I can break, break the tie. 
anyway, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Our next inductee is Howard Nevin. Here's a part of the story in the Daily Journal from Howard's last game as a football player versus Hermitown, a 46 to 21 victory that allowed the Broncos to finish that season at eight and one. Baltimore scored early in the second half when Nevin fired a bullet pass down the center of the field. Baltimore made a spectacular one-handed grab, pulled the ball in, avoided a pair of surprise secondary men, and dashed down the field on a 73-yard play. Nevin played receiver on a hot punt three plays later and returned it 74 yards for another six points. Now that is the kind of quick strike offense that Coach Norquist was known for, right? Here's what's written on Howard's plaque. Howard Devin was born November 12, 1959 in Hibby, Minnesota. Howard would letter 10 times as a Bronco athlete before his graduation in 1978, three times in football, three times in basketball, and four times in track and field. Nevin was team captain of the 1977 Bronco football team that won the final Iron Ridge Conference title. He was named All-IRC, Associated Press All-State, and played in the Shrine All-Star Game. Nevin played on the 1977 Iron Range Conference champion boys basketball team and captained the 1978 team. He was named All-IRC in 1977 and 1978. In track and field, Howard was IRC champion in the 100 and 200 yard dashes in 1977 and then went on to win the region seven title in the 100 dash. He was named team captain in 1978 when the Broncos won the region seven team championship and the Broncos won four consecutive IRC titles each year that Nevin was a member of the team. Following graduation from FHS, Nevin would attend North Dakota State University, where he was a member of the Bison football team from 1978 to 1981. He was a starter on the 1981 team that won the North Central Conference Championship and was NCAA Division II runners-up. Howard would letter twice at NDSU before graduating with a business degree Nevin coached youth football and served for five years on the school board in Stoughton, Wisconsin. At the time of his induction, Howard was retired after 35 years of working for Procter & Gamble and living in Hastings with his wife, Michelle. They enjoy spending time with their daughters, sons-in-law, and three grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, 2024 Bronco Athletic Hall of Fame inductee, Howard Nevin. I got tired just listening to that. Um... But uh, before I get started, I'd just like to, uh, if you'd join me in wishing my wife, Michelle, a happy 60th birthday today. <laughs> She's gonna kill me for that, but that's, it's okay. I've never been to one of these events, and I've never heard anyone's speeches. But similar to Dave, I think those of us who grew up in the 60s and 70s and the falls, say the same thing. It was a great place to grow up. It was a great time to grow up. And Dave talked about playing hockey, playing boot hockey, and we skated at A Street Rink, played football, baseball in the backyard, and uh, it, it was just a great time. Tonight, I'd just like to say uh, how fortunate I was and many others to be able to play for three great Hall of Fame coaches. Stuart Nordquist, football coach, Dick Ostrud, our track coach, and uh, late Jim Rolando, our basketball coach. Uh, you know, consider this at the time. In sixth grade, Ray Wood, I believe, and Dick Ostrud started the Holler track meet. And we were the first class to run in the Holler track meet. And they, and they painted, literally painted a line on the parking lot in the playground, but it kind of got, got me hooked on track. In 1977, we were the first team to run on what was then the new Falls High track. And Dick Ostrich was very instrumental in, in both of those things. Uh, Dick went on to a 30-year coaching career, and he's already in the Bronco Hall of Fame. Jim Rolando moved to the Falls in the 70s, took over as basketball coach. Um, he started in the first year here. I was in sixth grade, and he started, I think it was then called the Baby Bronco Basketball Program. The real jerseys, and got your name in the paper, and it was kind of exciting. 
in 1976-77 with a senior class, guys like Tim Wren, Rick Matiski, Jeff Friend, when we won the Iron Range Conference Championship. Jim Rolando went on to coach for 30 plus years and he's in the Bronco Hall of Fame. Stuart Norquist moved to town in the early mid 70s. I think we were in ninth grade and you know, here's this new young coach and new jerseys, new helmets, new offense, new defense. And we were excited to play for him. But when we got to these sophomores, we found out we weren't that good. We weren't very big, but we got a little better. I think we did, we were three and six according to the record books. Um, next year, we were very optimistic. We thought, boy, this is, this is it. We started out one and four, and we showed up at practice the next week and already said we're throwing everything out. We're going to introduce, put in a new offense. There's double wing, and I thought, boy, this better work, or we're all going to go down in flames. I thought it was, it was, it was iffy, but we won four games in a row, and we went in that senior season. We thought, boy, this is it. And some of us went to summer football camp, and nobody from the falls ever went to a summer football camp. We started out. My Grand Rapids friend uh, informed me that. We lost to Grand Rapids in the, in the first game of the year. We beat Eveleth, and then we went to Hibbing. And I think, if Nordy told me the right, correct thing, I think they were two in the state. They were undefeated, and we hadn't beat Hibbing since 1969. And we went there, and two touchdowns by Dave Lorian, and we went 15 to six. And we never lost another game all year. And I think when I talked to Nordy, and we talked over the years, he said, you know, that game kind of turned everything around. Everybody started to believe, you know, what he was doing. And Nordy had a great 40-year career, and he's already in the Hall of Fame. And if I could take a second, I'd just like to recognize the seniors uh, on that team. There was 13 of them besides me. I think you might remember some of the names. Gary Balcom, Dave Lorian, Steve Rees, Greg Johnson, Ken Corbett's, Randy Hodell, Donnie Volta, Willie Koschuk, Tim Fulton, Pete Taro, Bill Johnson, Kurt Knapp, and Howard Grenville. And since Schmidt's here, not only do we have great long-term head coaches, we had guys like Bruce Schmidt, Ray Wood, Dwayne Johnson, Stan Johnson, Jim Larson. I mean, just great, long-time, successful coaches. And well, before I, before I forget, I had it at the beginning and I skipped it. I want to recognize my two daughters and their husbands and my, well, my granddaughter was here. I think she took off, but yeah, appreciate all my family, my brothers, my sister and all their spouses. So great family. And uh, we learned playing football in the backyard. Uh, some tough lessons, I think, but it was, but it was fun. I want to close with a short story. Is Mike Williams still here? Many of you know Mike from Kettle Falls, Thunderbird Lodge, um, Rainier Lake Fishing Guide. Mike is my wife Michelle's uncle. And I didn't know Mike in high school, but probably 20, 25 years after I graduated, we were at Thunderbird on vacation, and Mike said, boy, we really enjoyed watching you guys play football in high school. And I said, well, gee, thanks. Um, did you know anybody on the team? He said, no, we just enjoyed going to the games. And he said, matter of fact, when you were a senior in 1977, we were up at Kettle Falls for the fall. And me and Hank Thompson would get in a boat at Kettle Falls, go to Ashkenham, drive into town, have dinner, watch the game, Go back, get in the boat in the dark, obviously, in September and October, and watch your games. And I said, wow, that, that is impressive. And I said, uh, how many times did you do that? And of course, Mike, he said, well, I think you had five home games that year, so we went to all five. <laughs> so okay. And he said, you know, it's the games got over a little early. Sometimes we'd stop at the Elks Club and have a couple of beers. And I said, oh, and he said, we'd usually see her dad down there. <laughs> and when he said that, I knew it was a true story. <laughs> but fast forward to tonight, 
And when I got the call that I was being inducted into the Hall of Fame, my first thought, my first thought was, I wonder if anyone's going to be there. I thought that would be embarrassing if nobody showed up. I mean, do, does anybody really care what happened 45 or 50 years ago? Well, I guess the answer is yes. And I appreciate it. So thanks for. Thank you. Thanks for a great honor and a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Our first team inductee tonight is the 1992 Girls 4x800 Relay Team. As I've been doing all night long, here's the story from the Daily Journal. To be honest with you all, I got pretty worked up when I read this the first time, so kudos to Chris Todd who wrote this story. Here we go. We wanted to finish in the top three, Tamara said. Uh, Lori ran a really, so we're all satisfied with second, Lori really ran a great last leg. Indeed, the eighth grader was in sixth place when she took the baton on the final two laps, but made up ground quickly on the first lap and ran into fourth. The early sprint took its toll and she faded into fifth place again as the leaders headed into the stiff breeze on the first straightaway. But she summoned a second wind on the following turn and again started to make up ground. I was in fifth and the sixth place runner was right behind me so I knew I had to go, said Lori after the race. On the final straightaway, Lori passed two runners, then passed the third, who collapsed as Lori sprinted into second place. I went out fast, then decided to go a little slower so I would have something left for the finish, Lori added. It must have been a hell of a race. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time I will introduce the team members. I ask that each individual come up to come forward to accept a frame certificate and a history of Bronco track and field record book. Stuart, if you would come up and help me. First, Erica Bjorn. <laughs> Lori Schmidt Brady. <laughs> Tamara Schmidt Trenner. on behalf of the entire team, Coach Paul Jell. Come a little closer. <laughs> and we have to get in the order that we ran the race, the relay, so it was Tamara, Erica, Dana, and Lori, and then Molly, you were the alternate, but you, you're a big part of this team because you ran during the regular season too. Uh, this four by eight, 3,200 meter relay team, was outstanding. They, I believe, won every single four by eight race during the season, which were, uh, they won the Iron Range Conference race, they won the Section 7A Championship, and their only loss was the state meet, and Ringer, what was the name of that team again? Heron Lake. Heron, Heron Lake, which who knows where they're at, but somewhere <laughs> down south. But just to say something about each of these runners, uh, they were led by Tamara, this only senior on this squad. And Tamara, don't get mad at me when I say this, <laughs> She, when it came to race time, you didn't mess with her. She did whatever she had to do to keep that team in the race. And if a runner got too close to her, she wasn't afraid to get those elbows out and use them. She was like a lion. She would, if someone got in front of her, there was no quit. And she really 
set the example for these these other runners. Um, you did a great job. Erica Bjorn. She was only a little eighth grader back then, 32 years ago. And when Erica got the baton, it was unbelievable. The foot speed, the leg speed she had, it didn't matter how far someone was in front of her, she just went after them. And she didn't say a whole lot, but boy oh boy, she could run. And she probably still can. And then we had our third runner was Molly Wood and Dana Wagner. And uh, Dana ended up running at the state meet for us. And I compared Dana to the Energizer Bunny. You know that commercial? She just keeps going and going and going and she was steady every single meet. She did a great job for us. And then Lori Schmidt, another eighth grader. And something about girls when they're younger, they don't feel the pressure like some of the older, older girls. And Lori, like Tim read uh, in the newspaper or the sports article, she not only came back from in, uh, during that state championship meet, she came back in a lot of meets during the regular season and uh, allowed this team to, to win. But to have her in a state meet running against the best that there is in the state of Minnesota in Class A, to have her be in sixth place, and I can just see her getting the baton still and saying, I'm going to do it. And she did it. And uh, again, you, you five, you did a great job for us. And uh, you are very deserving of this award. Great job. And thank you. Thank you, Paul. Our final inductee tonight is the 1992 Bronco Girls cross country team. Here is a part of the story Chris Todd wrote for the Daily Journal. For the, for, for the past four years, the Bronco Girls cross country team has been knocking on the door labeled state champions. Saturday, the door finally opened. It's what we've been working for all these years, says, said Paul's senior, Jen Lee, who has been running for the Broncos since the seventh grade. I can say without a doubt that every hard workout we ever had was worth it. The Broncos won the Class A race with a team score of 104 points, one ahead of runner-up Sartell. I was overwhelmed when we heard we had won the state champs, said senior Molly Wood, another veteran who co-captained the team along with Lean. It makes all these years of cross country worth it, and it's something we will remember for a long time. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time I will introduce the team members. First, those that are not here with us this evening. Becky Lindgren Emerson, Jennifer Lean, and Mary Yuso Fredrickson. Now for those in attendance, I ask that each individual come up, uh, come forward to accept a framed certificate. Accepting for Brandy Griffith Airholmes, her mom, Cindy Griffith Story. <laughs> Nissa Peterson Folger. Lori Schmidt Brady. <laughs> Molly Wood Davis. <laughs> Jennifer McKeenan Clark. <laughs> Head coach Ray Wood. <laughs> and accepting the induction on behalf of the entire team, Erica Bjorn. Well, it's a great honor to be here tonight and be back with all of these wonderful teammates um, from 1992 and all the years that we ran together are so special. Um, I was trying to be in touch with some of the people from our team who uh, were not able to be here tonight, and so I'm going to read a little bit of what um, Brandy Griffith Earhold sent to me, because uh, I think she, she put a lot of things really nicely. He says, greetings from Steamboat, Colorado. 
Coach Wood, and fellow teammates, what an honor it is for us to be recognized and inducted into the Bronco Hall of Fame with so many other legends. Some of my fondest memories came from our 1992 season. However, I think we would be remiss if we didn't start with the 1991 state championship in which we were runners up. Coach Wood saw a talent, had belief, and created a planned program for us to buy into. From team building at Lori's cabin to the first day of practice, I remember the motto of the season was pack attack, state attack. Um, so it was really nice to hear from Brandy, and I know she and, and others wish they could be here tonight. It's fitting for this team to receive, the, to receive this award. Everything about how we trained, raced, strategized was team-oriented rather than individually driven. It was a team culture fostered by Coach Wood with his pack attack strategy where we would all run together as a group for the first mile of the race, but also embraced and shaped by everyone on the team. And even though this award is for the team that won the state championship in 1992, I think probably in all of our minds, it also goes to all the members of the cross country and long distance teams during that time, which felt like some real glory years before and after uh, 1992. And a lot of other people here in Tamra feel like you're part of this award for sure, and others too. It was so fun and rewarding to be on a team with such dedicated athletes, and it felt a little bit like just the right people at the right time, but it was also the right, hardest working, mentally tough, humble, kind, and supportive people who put in the time and effort to get where we, where we got that year. When I closed out my high school senior year, I needed a break from running, and I did take a break, but good things come back, and the foundation I got with Bronco Cross Country must have stayed inside me, and now running has become one of my most treasured times of any day I get to do it, and one of my most important well-being activities. I can't thank Mr. Wood for, as, Dan, as Brandy said, seeing our talent and believing in us, and the team for giving me this gift of all the wonderful memories, except for maybe the interval repeats, I'm not sure if those are good memories. Um, and what goes, yeah, let's see. I think the team would like to also thank the Hall of Fame committee and all of our family members and all of our friends and the community that supported us back then and who are here today with us. Um, I asked some of our team members, because I was doing this speech, if there was anything they wanted to share in terms of things that you know we've taken with us from that time into our lives now. And some of the things I heard from people were um, for instilling a lifelong love of running, the importance of being on a team and good friends, so many fond memories, and really the, the experience that each one of us was such a valuable member of a team and doing it for each other. I, I don't think any of us were in it for kind of the personal glory. I think being on a team with such good athletes is really what motivated us and we learned a lot from that. So it's a great honor and we thank you all for being here. Thanks to the committee.